Dear learners, greetings from IIT Kohati. We are in the MOOCs course Power Plant System Engineering Module Number 4 Hydro and Renewable Energy Power Generation Systems. So, in this module lecture number 10, we are going to discuss about the energy storage schemes part 3 and in this lecture we will try to emphasize the following energy storage mechanisms. First is flywheel storage system, battery storage systems, magnetic storage systems, chemical reaction storage systems and finally, we will think about this hydrogen energy storage because this energy storage system is the driving mechanism for the next future generation power mode because hydrogen is treated as a clean fuel and it satisfies all the needs of zero carbon emissions. Now, out of this uh, uh, storage system, the first three that is flywheel, battery and magnetic, they fall under direct energy storage or direct electrical energy storage system. and chemical reaction storage it falls in a mode which is called as thermal storage mechanism. Hydrogen storage is a, an additional topic which you have introduced which we call it as a clean fuel and has potential for power generation in future. So, to start this storage things, first thing uh, I need to emphasize uh, that we require the energy storage mechanisms because to cater the need of peak demand, every power plant systems must have some mechanism to store the excess energy. And that excess energy has to be catered during the peak load demands. Hence, energy storage is inevitable and mostly for renewable power systems it is a must. Now, uh, to look for the cyclic variations uh, hourly, monthly or yearly, you need to tap the energy from the base plant and that has to be stored in a, in a particular mechanism and those energy has to be disposed of at the time of need. So, that is what we call this as a necessity for energy storage. Uh, so, the complete flow diagram talks about that we have primary heat source, method of storage is electrical and we have thermal and in our previous uh, lectures, we emphasized about the electrical storage mainly electromechanical systems stored by pumped hydro or compressed air storage things and we also discussed about the uh, ener thermal energy storage, uh, sensible heat, latent heat and in this lecture we will talk about some of the fundamental aspects of auxiliary energy resources which is mainly flywheel, then we have the storage systems and thirdly chemical reaction things. We will not go deep into this because this is not the part of this uh, complete coverage, but however, I uh, will try to emphasize the basic principle and working operations for all this type of uh, storage systems. Now, first thing is that a flywheel energy storage system. We all know that flywheel is a large is a large mass and this it stores the uh, kinetic energy and that kinetic energy uh, is typically uh, converted to a electrical motor generator set to tap uh, to, to discharge its energy. So, what we normally do is that during charging mode or off peak period, the flywheel is supposed to be attached to a motor generator set. So, which means that during charging phase that is off uh, peak period 
the motor adds energy to the flywheel and that energy is in the uh, form of uh, kinetic energy that motor uh, energy stored in the form of kinetic energy and for generation mode the flywheel rotor delivers this uh, kinetic energy to the generator during the peak demand period. Now, if you look at the how much energy is stored in a flywheel, this is a very simple expression. Uh, kinetic energy is expressed in terms of uh, uh, half m into v square. So, here v stands as a rotational speed multiplied by its linear length. So, linear length normally the flywheels are circular in uh, diameters. So, length travelled for each revolution is twice pi r multiplied by n, n stands as revolutions per second. So, half m v square now becomes to twice pi square m r square into n. Now, here r stands as radius of gyration. This, this radius of gyration is normally kept as large. Uh, of course, if you look at this expression, energy can be maximized by increasing the radius of gyration, uh, increasing the mass. So, the very fundamental features of storing energy in the form of flywheel is that you add large mass as well as large size. So, when you say large size because energy stored will be proportional to square uh, r square that, that means huge amount of energy can be stored if your radius of gyration is large. And coming back to speed revolution of speed revolution of speed uh, is n square. Uh, so, for flywheels normally what happens um, when at the time of discharge of energy from the flywheel kinetic energy is transferred back to the generator set which means that uh, uh, there is always a fluctuation of speed because uh, the demand and uh, the speeds are correlated. So, during the peak demand when this, there is a fluctuation of speeds that has to be restricted. So, for that things uh, what we can say is that we can uh, rewrite this expressions what we can say that energy captured or release the flywheel during this uh, between any two speeds of operations. So, this can be expressed as twice pi square m into r square into n 2 square minus n 1 square. So, this is what we uh, is the final expression that speed fluctuation, but normally we do not have much control about the fluctuation in the demands. So, what we can do is that whatever may be the fluctuation we can ensure that we are delivering the energy with least fluctuations with respect to speed. To counter this what we define a term called as coefficient of split fluctuation that is n 2 minus n divided by n, n stands at average speeds which is n 1 plus n 2 by 2. Now, from, from this expression we can now get back this particular expression delta E as a function of n which is the average speed that means, flywheel running at average speeds with a parameter called as coefficient of fluctuation k s. And this k s tells about whether the we are providing a steady energy or there is a fluctuation in the speed. Uh, so, for that reasons uh, this k s value is kept between 0 0.005 to 0 0.2 which means that this defines the closeness of speed regulations uh, for fine speed regulations k s is 0 0.005 for coarse split fluctuations let me fluctuation can go as high as 20 percent that means, 0 0.2 for uh, this thing. So, uh, that is the uh, control limit we can have for k s. So, the choice is with our hand what type of k s we are going to regulate. Now, to minimize this k, k s or fleet fluctuations what we expect is that mass of the mass and radius of gyration of the flywheel must be high to have a very close speed uh, regulation. So, uh, now coming back to the flywheel design criteria. So, a rotating flywheel when it is at high speed it is always subjected to a stress level and this stress level keeps you alert about the 
critical design considerations. Uh, so, there are two parameters that is used for considering this design criteria. First one is theoretical maximum specific energy which means energy absorbed per unit mass of the flywheel that is which is characterized in terms of its mass of the flywheel. Other thing is that which is characterized in the form of volume of the or size of the flywheel that is maximum volumetric specific energy uh, which is absorbed uh, that is energy absorbed per unit volume. Then again we try to correlate this energy a specific energy with respect to material properties. So, here we can say that maximum specific energy is dependent to stress to density ratio. So, uh, in terms of mass we write E by A max as a function of C 1 into K m into sigma by rho. Sigma stands as allowable stress in which flywheel material is prepared rho stands as the density of the flywheel. Other part that means, if you want to convert in terms of volume that means, maximum volumetric specific energy this uh, we can this part that means, k m by rho can be defined as k v and that k v we call this as a volume efficiency factor. So, here there are two important parameters here mass efficiency factor and volume efficiency factor and these two factors regulate the maximum specific energy. Now, how to regulate or how to control this k m and k v? So, for that reason we need to think about uh, whether the flywheel is designed in a continuous isotropic material or anisotropic material or it is designed uh, the material is designed based on considering variety of constituents with their mass fractions or volume fractions. So, for that reasons to make it light, but uh, then at, uh, uh, based on these things the K m and K v are chosen. So, here the plot here that talks about the mass efficiency factor K m and volume efficiency factor K v. So, it has been plotted for variety types of materials. First is constant stress type or isotropic materials, but we can see they have a constant type of property mass and volume fractions and they are uh, closely related, but with some point of volume efficiency factor the mass efficiency factor drops down. Another category called as uh, uniaxial composite materials they fall under the mass and uh, volume efficiency factor falls in the range of 0.6. Third category uh, is variable density materials, they have good mass efficiency factor, but less volume efficiency factor and uniform rods they are also least favored. So, basically speaking that we have to uh, choose the K b and K m such a way that we can maximize this uh, uh, specific energy either in the form of its volumetric in terms of its volume or in terms of its mass. Hence, uh, the design criteria for flywheel uh, is as follows. The materials for the flywheel energy storage must have high strength, high strength to density ratio, high resistance to cyclic crack growth because this, uh, this cyclic word is a very common in flywheel because it is continuously charging and discharging. Then uh, it should have high strength to strength uh, to density uh, to high strength uh, density to cost ratio. So, these factors decides what type of material to be used. Now, typical materials are alloy steel, fiber reinforced plastics, Kevlar epoxy. So, such kind of things are there. In addition to that the flywheel energy storage also incurs uh, losses in terms of windage, bearing, eddy current and so on. Now, uh, to give a conceptual idea that how much what is the uh, kind of energy storage we are looking at uh, if you want to go for a flywheel energy storage systems. We, if you think of 10,000 kilowatt hour of energy to 
for the delivered which needs to be stored in a flywheel rotor and which should rotate at 1200 rpm which is typically a type of speed that IC engines uh, normally operate. So, they can be prepared with anisotropic composite materials for which the mass requirement will be 3.3 into 10 to the power 5 kg and the sizes it can be of inner outer diameter 4.3 meter, 6.2 meter and 3 meter. So, this these are just some uh, tentative numbers that will talk about the type of or typical size or storage unit we require. So, there is no point in going for low energy storage by going for large cost or large size of the material. So, next type of energy storage system uh, which is a direct form of is called as electric battery. D in our day to day life we all come across various type of uh, batteries and in typical batteries is lead acid battery. This is a very common in our day to day life and uh, uh, but in a large scale uh, a direct method of energy storage in terms of lead acid battery can be considered. So, lead acid battery is a direct current battery which are conventionally used in the motor vehicles even, even all uh, uh, vehicles has this type of battery. So, uh, typically it contains 6 number of volatilic cells and, and they are connected in series for a 12 volt capacity. And each, each of these batteries, uh, the typical circuit diagram of a lead acid battery is shown here. Uh, here we have one unit and it, it is a, it is a uh, the working principle falls, uh, we call this as a electrochemical reaction. And here we have an anode and we have cathode. In the anode, we have lead solid and in the cathode, we have lead oxide which is solid. And they are kept in an aqueous solutions which is H2SO4 with sulfuric acid. And this side we have lead and this side we have lead oxide. Now, what happens during the design phase? We say that we need to have an anode which is considered with a spongy gray lead and uh, for cathode which is formed from the uh, lead oxides and both of them are immersed in a water solutions of sulfuric acid in a separate compartment which is this. So, then what we have what happens during charging and discharging? The lead lead in the anode oxidized, oxidizes to iron immediately when it precipitates as lead sulphate. So, when uh, lead becomes um, oxidizes uh, to um, ions and during the discharge phase, this is what we do in the charging phase and during discharge phase, the uh, 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 okay, uh, lead becomes uh, uh, oxidized to uh, form ions and in the cathode, the lead oxide uh, becomes takes this ion to get back to uh, the PBSO4 and, and again the forms as aqueous solutions. So, through this process what we get? We get some free electrons in the anode and that is the driving force for the current flow in the circuit. Now, in the discharge phase all the plates are slowly and I means through the, the, the now this is what we see in the charging during discharge phase both lead uh, anode and cathode sections are slowly covered with lead sulphates, uh, sulphate that replaces lead in the anode and lead oxide in the cathode. So, through this process what we can see is that the concentration of sulphuric acid will drop so, which means that the uh, we are it is an indication that we are entering into a partially discharged cell. Now, in the charging mode, the battery can be restored to the uh, original conditions by the reversing the direction of current in the electron flow. 
So, both cathode and uh, anode they are taken into account simultaneously to ensure that we are entering, we are doing charging and discharging in a uh, cyclic process. Since it is a cyclic process, we expect that with time the performance will drop down. So, this is what happens the lead acid battery deteriorates its performance typically after 2000 uh, cycles due to irreversible physical changes in the electrodes. But however, since it is an electrical based storage system, uh, we can expect that turnaround efficiency that is charging and discharging efficiency for this kind of storage systems is, is falls in the range of 70 to 80 percent. So, this is typically comparable with pumped hydro and compressed air storage systems. Uh, however, uh, we do not consider this particular application in a large scale. So, here I have emphasized only one lead uh, one type of battery storage that is lead acid battery, but there are possibilities that we can have uh, for a large scale utility applications. We can have sodium sulfur, zinc chloride battery, lithium chloride, lithium um, tellofluoride batteries all these things can be considered. Uh, high energy, low mass, long cycle life should be the characteristics of battery storage for high energy utility requirement. We will now move on to next type of energy storage system which is the direct energy with the, uh, that concept is called as magnetic energy storage. Magnetic energy storage is based on the principle what is called as superconductivity. The basic definition goes as follows which means that dependence of electrical resistance of metals at cryogenic temperatures means when we are talking about uh, in the order of 90 Kelvin is observed by the phenomena called as superconductivity. That means we are looking at the resistance of materials at cryogenic temperatures which uh, uh, this particular property called as superconductivity that means some of the materials have inherent characteristics they lose resistance uh, when they are kept at uh, cryogenic temperatures close to in the range of uh, 90 Kelvin or less. Hence, we call this superconductivity as the set of physical properties which are observed in certain materials for which the electrical resistance vanishes. When the electrical resistance vanishes side by side the magnetic fields becomes predominant and they are expelled from the materials. So, the, that means at cryogenic temperatures those materials behave those metals behave as magnets. So, this is the basic principle of superconductivity. However, all materials do not exhibit superconductivity. This is only some materials can exhibit. The temperature below which the metal becomes superconductive is called as transition or critical temperatures. Any material exhibiting this property is called as a superconductor for which the resistance drops to 0 below its critical temperatures. So, these concepts gives rise to the fact that we can store a magnetic energy by using superconducting materials. Initially, the superconductive uh, magnetic storage was considered for pulsed energy storage. It like that means, we are storing wherever there is a pulse energy requirement instantly there is large energy requirement we can give that energy for a while. But if you want to store it for a large time durations, then we require some kind of uh, charging and discharging circuit. So, in a pulse energy storage, we the charging and discharging times are very short, but for long durations, we require some kind of designs in which we can store magnetic energy uh, by using superconducting materials. 
So, hence the concept of this superconductivity for certain materials is found to be suitable for large scale energy storage utility systems. So, the principle states that energy can be stored in the magnetic field associated with the coil which are made out of superconducting materials. When the temperature of the coil is maintained below its critical temperature and once the coil is charged that it will that current will not decay which means uh, resistance drops to 0 current does not fall down means resistance uh, the material behaves as if it does not offer any resistance to the current flow. Then it can store this magnetic energy and now because the now that that conditions the metal becomes magnet. So, we call this that a magnetic energy which can be stored indefinitely and this stored energy can be released back to the network by discharging the coil. Now, I will give you some basic principle for understanding for magnetic energy storage with some little bit of mathematical background. So, we call this as a, a simple functional relations where we need to bring into the fact of a few uh, electrical terms. First thing is that we call this as a inductance of a coil is a function of its dimension and it is characterized for a uh, coil which is made uh, which is commonly a super uh, which is called as a conductor and we call we take this as a rectangular cross sections. So, basically we are looking at a um, conductor electrical conductor with dimensions A and B and this is positioned at some axis with reference to some axis at a distance r and this uh, we are going to see whether uh, for this kind of geometrical configurations how much we can and if it behaves as a superconductor then how, how we can define its energy storage capacity or magnetic energy storage capacity. So, energy stored in a superconducting uh, coil can be simply expressed as E is equal to half L into I square. L stands as inductance, I stands as current. Now, for this kind of uh, uh, geometry and there are some mathematical treatment which was done and finally, for a superconducting situations, the electrical uh, energy stored in the conductor can be expressed by this functional relations that is 1 by 4 pi to the power minus 5 by 3 f zeta delta zeta b to the power 5 by 3 and j. Now, let us understand each terms uh, here. So, f zeta and delta we call this as a form functions which is basically geometrical part of this coil. And zeta stands as zeta we call this as another kind of uh, geometrical function which is twice by r by square root of a b. V stands as volume of the conductor per one coil turn and that is equal to 8 pi r q by zeta square. J we call this as a current density and that is defined by the number of turns into current flow into a into b. Other term that is there delta this is nothing but the aspect ratio of the coil and induction of the coil is a function of L is equal to f times zeta it, uh, r into n square. So, when you put this inductance value here, we arrive at this expressions. But however, there are lot of work that has been carried out in this manner and people try to find out for a given coil how much maximum en magnetic energy we can store. So, it was found out a coil that gives maximum value of volume to inductance is called as a Brooks coil and that Brooks coil stores maximum energy, maximum magnetic energy. Now, th using that Brooks coil concept, this energy stored for a Brooks coil, we call this as a reference point that is the maximum energy. It is expressed as E b is equal to 3.028 into 10 to the power minus 8 b to the power 5 by 3 into j square. So, this Brooks coil is made as standard. Now, for any other coil, if you want to find out how much magnetic energy you can store, 
then we refer with respect to Brooks coil and to find out a fraction called as energy fractions. But most difficult part of this thing is that it is very difficult to achieve this uh, Brooks coil uh, concept. So, but uh, it is uh, normally energy stored for any conventional coil available coil. Then another characteristics part for magnetic energy storage we require because since because you have aspect ratio sizes all are involved. So, this will give you the volume of material per unit energy stored that is expressed as V by E and this is expressed uh, E stands as F time E B big, um, Brooks coil and this uh, expression is like 0 0.033 uh, 3 into 10 to the power 8 divided by F into V to the power 2 by 3 into J square. So, this expression gives the uh, actual utility for magnetic energy storage concept. What it tells is that the volume of material per energy stored is a function of current density and the volume of the material and volume of the material becomes larger means cost will be larger. So, a counter or balancing approach is taken care because we cannot always have a Brooks coil because Brooks coil gives the maximum energy storage and it has a for the a factor to be 1 and uh, we, it has some unique dimension of the uh, uh, cross section of the material. So, for that reasons uh, we take this parameter V by E as the characteristics parameter for magnetic energy storage and try to see the physical significance how it how what is the possible way that a magnetic uh, storage uh, coil can be designed or superconducting coil can be designed. So, this particular talked about uh, the uh, plot talks about the, uh, the aspect ratio of the coil which is delta A by B to the, uh, the uh, zeta value which is a um, another geometrical parameter twice r by square root of AB. And when it is uh, plotted we start with the factor called as form factor. So, as you proceed further your storing capacity drop because F becomes smaller and smaller. If you are going towards Brook coil for which F becomes 1 we are storing maximum energy. But storing maximum energy we can have V 0 by V close to 1 and, uh, uh, and so the cost factor also that volume becomes high. So, cost factor also goes up. Hence, a magnetic storage need a very large structural mass to contain the uh, maximum uh, stored energy, but to store uh, if you store maximum energy this gives a high value of uh, radial outward force for the solenoid because the, the, the that coil now becomes a solenoid or the magnet and it gives a very ra radial uh, outward force. So, to counteract that always Brooks coil is not preferred. So, that is the idea that design of a magnetic storage systems require the knowledge of important factor that is volume of the material uh, per energy stores uh, which demonstrates the economy scale of the coil. The cost of the coil is proportional to its volume and the cost of energy stored is inversely proportional to volume and the current density. Hence, the main mechanical problem which is associated for a magnetic storage is very large structural mass and to contain the magnetic field energy. But when you talk about large magnetic and uh, high magnetic energy it gives large outward force for the solenoid. So, a balancing approach is made in which we can say that uh, we can uh, have choice of mass of the material and the amount of energy requirement. Now, for a typical proposed magnetic storage systems there are some silent features. So, if you are looking at magnet energy storing in a magnetic field form as 500, 500, 5500 megawatt hour we require some kind of uh, super critical fluid which should uh, which will make this magnet uh, which will make the conductor to be a sup, um, super conductor 
and this material has to be prepared with a special type of things which has which exhibits the characteristics feature of superconductivity and typically it is an aluminum of uh, alloy of aluminum, niboidium and titanium and we require a low aspect ratio cylindrical structure which means typically it can have inner diameter of 1570 meter 5 mm meter thickness 16 mm long this is of course too high for uh, this uh, energy storage of 5500 megawatt hour and we also need uh, the solenoid which must have around at least 112 tons that carries uh, 765,000 ampere current and this amount this number is very large. Because of this high current we expect a tensile load magnetic tensile load close to 3.3 into 10 to the power 10 Newton uh, in the range of 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the 11 Newtons and of course radial pressure of uh, 4 bar which means uh, of course, it is good that they will have a very good turnaround efficiency during charging and discharging. So, hence the choice of magnetic storage decides the type of material. Now, when you choose this uh, kind of material, we also have to make a judgment that what current density we are handling. And when we look for this current, this we have to see that stability range for the current should be within that within uh, within the acceptable limit. The next important segment of our storing in energy is the chemical reaction storage and this is a kind of a thermal energy storage and we all know that any a chemical reaction is characterized by endothermic or exothermic reaction. Endothermic reaction means energy absorbing exothermic reaction means energy releasing. So, this uh, these two characteristics behavior of a chemical reaction can be thought of charging and discharging process of energy. So, uh, if by some mechanisms you can initiate this reactions and continuously reaction becomes reversible, then we can utilize this energy for as a storage mechanisms. So, this concept we call this as a chemical reaction storage. A reversible chemical process is used to store the thermal energy during an endothermic reaction. The energy is released during exothermic reactions. The heat of reactions which is nothing but the higher heating value which includes the uh, condensation of water is used as the process that in, which is interpreted as energy stored during a chemical reactions. So, this is something similar to an alternative way that um, which is thought of either in, in, um, in the absence of latent heat or sensibly thin energy storage things medium. Now, when you talk about this exothermic reactions which is occurs in the form of a catalyst we call as a methanation and endothermic reaction purpose is we, we refer as a uh, uh, reformations. Why we are talking about methanation? Because we are considering a very familiar reactions in which uh, particularly um, um, applicable for nuclear reactor thermal energy storage systems uh, which says that a reversible reaction in which carbon monoxide reacts with hydrogen to form methane and H2O. So, here two important catch is there one is process of methane formation, other is process of hydrogen generations and reaction is reversible. When we have reaction is reversible, we, we can think that energy released during this process and energy absorbed can be interpreted. So, that is the way we call this uh, with respect to this reaction we call this as methanation and reformation. So, reformation is a process by which low grade or low molecular weight hydrocarbon is catalytically reformed to high grade or high molecular weight high, um, hydrocarbon. So, this process is also referred as the production of hydrogens from the methane 
and steam in presence of nickel catalyst. Methanation is the production of methane from the mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogens. Now, to explain this, let us try to understand this particular figure which talks about schematic flow diagram of a power plant using a chemical storage systems where we consider this chemical reaction as CO plus H2 gives CH4 and H2O and reaction is reversible and through this uh, um, uh, reaction energy released or energy absorbed is close to 250.3 kilojoule per gram mole. And typically the power plant that operates uh, using this chemical reactions has similar to a conventional main power plant. So, if you take this particular part which is the primary plant and that operates at base load, we are just tapping some of the energy or heat from this circuit uh, from this primary heat circuit and form two reactor one is reformer which is an endothermic reactor other, other is methanator which is exothermic reactor. And uh, this for reformer which is an endothermic reactor it takes out CH4 and H2O and CH4 and H2O is here and um, for methanator and it takes CO and H2 which is taken from here. And this process keeps on happening for charging and discharging phase. Now, how it operates? Uh, of course, both the reactors operate at different pressure, has to be operated at different pressures because your charging and discharging conditions are different. Normally, reformer operates at low pressure to maximize the rate of endothermic reactions. In the lean period, certain quantity of heat from the primary uh, uh, heat source is diverted to this endothermic reactor and um, uh, and it is uh, which is stored at ambient pressure and high pressure of 70 bar. During high demand period the reactants are fed to uh, methanator which is an exothermic reactor where heat is generated to run the peak turbines. So, there are two turbines one is primary turbine other is peak turbine. So, the peak turbine operates with this fluid and again the reactants are converted back to products which is stored in a separate vessel for a separate, um, for later use in the reformer. And typically we are considering a storage pressure which of close to 70 bar and these uh, storage units reactors can be kept either above ground in a large steel tank or it can be an underground cavern. And for this case the chemical reaction uh, situations we can expect the turnaround efficiency of 85 to 90 percent. So, this particular uh, thing uh, gives the schematic of a chemical reaction storage, but however there are other possible chemical reactions one can think of uh, for uh, reversible chemical think of for energy storage. Here we have talk only discussed about CO and H2 gives CH4 and H2O. Other combination is possible CO plus H2 can give also CH4 and CO2, but at different pressure and temperature conditions. But here we can say that uh, storing capacity falls in the range of 72,200 um, Kelvin and heat of reactions we can expect at room temperature of 298 Kelvin as in the range of 250 kilojoule per gram mole. Apart from this there are other chemical energy storage situations, but the however they have lesser value of energy release. The last segment of our energy storage section is hydrogen energy storage. Although it does not fall in our uh, conventional loop of uh, primary or primary energy resources or thermal energy store. But nowadays hydrogen uh, energy storage through hydrogen uh, has received the attention around the globe because hydrogen is treated as a ultimate clean fuel and it is a energy storage medium and it can lead to zero carbon emission. This advantage 
uh, has given the idea that concept of hydrogen economy in terms of storage and cheap transmission for a long distance. Now, hydrogen the standard process of hydrogen formations can come from a very fundamental electrolysis of water. Uh, by using electrolysis of water, we can get high quality energy that can be again combusted back to uh, um, water again with without any pollutions. However, production of hydrogen can happen by any uh, any of these following methods. They are thermal decomposition of water with thermochemical cycle, catalytic steam reforming in, uh, of natural gas, industrial photosynthesis, ultraviolet radiations, partial oxidations of heavy oils and some of the reactions which I have already covered in our chemical reactions which is CO plus H2 uh, gives CH, CH4 plus H2O. And we also can think of a water gas reaction uh, when you deal with the coal as a uh, fossil fuel for the power plants where we can see carbon can mix with uh, water to form CO and H2 this is another way. Electrical decomposition of water through electrolysis which is here and this is a very standard method where 2 H2O uh, at cathode gives you H2 plus 2 OH anode and at anode we can get back uh, the hydrogen back. Now, the main drawback of this hydrogen is its uh, extreme flammability because hydrogen is gas is considered as a highly flammable gas which means that 4 percent mole fraction uh, in air is still flammable at room temperatures. So, and also associated problems with storing under pressure. Hydrogen as it is, it is very difficult to store. So, hence normally store liquefaction of hydrogen uh, storage is another solutions, but again it consumes lot of energy. So, people have evolved variety mechanism to find different routes to store hydrogen. One such uh, things which I, which already uh, I have mentioned in the form of methane. One can think of that CO and H2 can give CH4 and H2O. This process gives uh, um, uh, about energy release of 200 kilojoule and for carbon when it reaction with hyd hydrogen it gives 73 kilojoule per uh, kilojoule. So, one way is that methane route we can store hydrogen. Other is through ammonia. Uh, another attractive route is ammonia. So, here and it is a standard process called as Haber process. Nitrogen reacts with hy uh, hydrogen to form ammonia. So, the, through this process we can have 90 kilojoule of uh, energy. So, basically speaking all these reactions talks about the various mechanisms how we can uh, store hydrogen not in its, its purest form in the other form. One way is methane, other is ammonia. But uh, uh, because through this process what advantage we get higher energy density, easy liquefaction process and safe storage. So, hence hydrogen is considered as primary fuel for peak power generations. Apart from this storing mechanism with either in a compressed gas form, liquefied form, chemical compound, there are possible other method is in the form of metal hydrides. Nowadays, this is receiving a, a very good catch. Why we look for uh, metal hydro, uh, hydride based storage systems? Because first point is the cost of liquefaction is high and bulk storage of hydrogen as a compressed air requires large size underground caverns which is similar to a natural gas. Hydrogen in chemical compound like methane or ammonia is more commendable to energy storage. Liquid hydrogen has mass energy density three times higher than any other fuel. 
but it requires uh, cryogenic temperatures which is highly inflammable but through this process storing is uh, it is a very costly affair but however when we the storing liquid hydrogen is very much attractive for thrust generation in heavy surface transports and aircraft mainly high uh, rocket fuel rocket engines use liquid hydrogen as a fuel the principal disadvantage of hydro high pressure storage uh, hydrogen system is because they have highly explosive and require large storage space so every storing uh, every method has its own advantage and disadvantage but another choice that people think of is the concept of metal hydrides is another alternative or viable options so how this metal hydrides works the primary aim is to select a hydride which can be thermally decomposed in a reversible manner so that hydrogen may be withdrawn or uh, or entered into the system the choice of metal hydrides has many desired features because they have high hydrogen content per unit mass of the metal low dissociation pressures at moderate temperatures constant dissociation pressure during decomposition safe exposure to atmosphere and low cost when hydrides are stored uh, as hydrogen stores in heat engine the waste heats again uh, again can be returned to hydrides and as a thermal storage device so hydrides has ad additional advantage as as waste heat thermal energy storage so considering this uh, typical advantage of metal hydride based storage systems i am trying to emphasize how it works and what is its viability which says that uh, uh, how it works typically we say that hydrogen when it reacts with a metal it forms an hydride and heat so we say charging means it's a heat release and discharging means heat additions now for example if you take this kind of material fe tie h 1.7 when it becomes uh, uh, another uh, compound fe tie h 0.1 it becomes it releases 1856 kilo joule per um, kg other kind of material is in, the, in terms of magnesium magnesium through this process hydride systems we can expect 4036 uh, kilo joule per kg of energy uh, third choice is magnesium uh, hydrogen it uh, it can have uh, 9198 kilo joule per kg of energy so what i am trying to say is that choice of metal hydrides in titanium uh, magnesium and iron has a definite scope as a metal hydride based storage systems so if you can typically compare a conventional liquid fuel which is nothing but your fossil fuel and with respect to hydrogen and hydrogen can be stored either in the gas form or liquid form or metal hydride form we can say a relative comparison mass uh, energy density for conventional fuel is 44000 whereas uh, for hydrogen it is 140000 kilo joule per kg similarly of course volume density will be less uh, volume energy density will be less uh, which will, will also be high that is 1700 mega joule per meter cube and here uh, it is here for conventional fuel it is of course Uh, uh, volume energy density is uh, high now if if you talk uh, in terms of liquid and metal hydrides they are also equally compatible but when you talk about metal hydrides and their volume energy densities are relative high so that is the catch that when you store energy we have to store in terms of its volume part so this is how we can say that hydrogen is one uh, economic or viable energy options as a clean fuel clean and renewable fuel and which catches the attention across the globe 
mainly because it has a cheap transmission energy over long distance. So, one can conceptual thoughts it can have that from a large scale power station if we want to extract hydrogen energy there are possibilities that we can think of storage underground, we can storage in terms of liquid, we can uh, through this transmission process we can fed it to power system, we can uh, send it to industrial and um, fuels and also we can have synthetic chemicals, we can also explore the domestic fuels. So, this particular cheap transmission of energy gives you attention for hydrogen for next generation systems. So, with this I complete entire module. So, after completing the entire module I will now try to revisit what we have explained in our intro lectures. The entire course has been constituted in four modules. Module 1 review of concept and basic thermodynamics where we I have emphasized about the basic requirement for uh, uh, to understand this course for various concepts uh, which is uh, covered in this course and in the module 2 which is uh, which we cover as a uh, complete module about considering about 50 percent of our lecture components. Third module is on gas turbines and combined power systems where I try to emphasize about gas turbine as power generations, gas turbines as thrust generations and combined power systems and to some extent I have given some brief introduction about aircraft propulsion systems. And other important module which is the last module which is hydro and renewable energy generation systems and uh, which we can say this complete process which involves energy conversion end of the way we have thermal energy, electrical energy and mechanical energy and variety of other resources which we have covered in our module is hydro and wind. We have covered geothermal energy to some extent we have covered uh, chemical fuels. We also covered most of the case thermal energy from the, from the coal, from the coal combustions then we have latent heat energy storage, energy storage things latent heat uh, and uh, sensibility storage. Through the electrical case we have battery storage, magnetic storage and in mechanical form of energy we have considered about the flywheel storage, hydro and wind so much things we have covered. But what we have not covered is solar and nuclear however these two co courses are uh, very vast and users and I mean future we may think of developing similar courses on solar and nuclear. But however, these courses are very specific in nature those learners which uh, and of course, in these two cases many resource materials are already available. Uh, so, with these notes I uh, conclude uh, my lectures and I hope great success for to all of you in the final exam. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your time that you have spent devoted in understanding these lectures. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.